Today, uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, disruptive creativity and specifically disruptive technologies. Uh, my intent for this presentation was to come in and talk about uh, all the disruptive technologies and all this sort of independent software and applications that are being used uh, and, and really sort of scrutinize them. And uh, so I began with doing a little bit of uh, market or industry research and I found uh, some uh, sort of divergent areas that were almost more interesting than even looking at the technology itself. So uh, some of the sort of predictions or suggestions, suggestions that I'm going to have about disruptive technologies uh, will be sort of more generalized based on that market research. So, uh, just so you know, uh, my name is Dr. Doug Bielmeyer. Please just call me Doug. Uh, I'm sure I'll see you, a bunch of you around this weekend. Um, I have a doctorate in education. Uh, I've been teaching for about 15 years now uh, at the graduate and undergraduate level. Uh, the former studio manager and designer of the Clear Lab Recording Studio uh, at Purdue University. Uh, my current research uh, always focuses on uh, the relationship between audio education and the industry, uh, DIY circuit building, and networked audio. Um, I've had 15 years experience uh, in studio and live sound work uh, in Nashville, Washington, D.C., and now here in Boston. Uh, I've lived here in Boston since August, so you may not want to ask me for directions, but technically <laughs> I am from here. Um, so speaking of that, uh, today we're going to, uh, I also am currently uh, an associate teaching professor uh, at Northeastern. So uh, it wasn't that long of a walk to come across the street. So uh, and it, this is always a fantastic event, but uh, it's great to uh, come across the street. So uh, today I'll talk about the purpose of uh, this uh, presentation. Uh, I'm also going to talk a little bit about defining what disruptive technology is. Uh, I'm going to do an industry review as well as a review of sound recording technicians. In other words, audio engineers, sound recording engineers, there's lots of names. Uh, I'll tell you why I, I picked SRT, or sound recording technicians. Uh, I also did uh, an independent survey or poll. If you're friends with me on Facebook at all or any social media, you probably saw that I was just painting the internets with this survey, so I apologize. Uh, and then I'll also talk a little bit at the end about predictions for disruptive technologies for the future. Uh, so the purpose of today's uh, presentation uh, is to uh, review the industry, uh, and not only just the industry, but uh, sound recording technicians. Uh, and this is in an effort to predict next generation technologies for creation, collaboration, and connectivity, which uh, directly relates to the sort of idea of uh, this whole conference. So disruptive technology. Uh, yes, I came here today in 2019 to still talk about MP3s, right? Uh, most of the students that I deal with uh, have never really used MP3s, they're not really aware of them. Uh, they've grown up in a culture that uh, is mostly dominated by streaming applications. But a disruptive technology and definition is truly one that uh, displaces established technologies um, or actually creates completely new industry uh, or destroys an old one or, or complicates an old one. So a great definition of that is an MP3 as a disruptive technology. Uh, it's a very old one. It was first designed in the late 80s, and actually by the mid-90s it was declared as being dead, uh, for which most of us are like, thank God. But um, it actually saw a second life when we started getting into peer-to-peer -peer file sharing networks uh, like Napster and many others, uh, and it basically ushered in the whole streaming uh, era that we have today, uh, which just sparked a, a complete structural change in how media is consumed, distributed, and even to some extent how it's recorded. Um, so even though this technology was des designed originally just to be a lossy format for reducing file size, the way it was used in society, uh, and the way it was used by certain businesses, uh, and actually it began in a dorm room over at Northeastern, um, but uh, that changed a lot about uh, the rest of the industry that we're gonna take a look at. So, um, uh, here's a fantastic chart. A lot of the information that I'm going to be showing you today um, it comes from uh, IBIS World, which uh, is a, a group of independent uh, marketing and economists uh, who look at a variety of different um, uh, industries within the United States as well uh, as the world. Uh, I focused on their statistics for the, uh, the US uh, for this 
uh, presentation. So uh, I think when we're talking about the record industry or recording industries or music industries, uh, major record labels uh, usually seem to be sort of the uh, linchpin and also because often a lot of the work that we do in audio production facilities uh, and within the audio production industry uh, feeds into those major labels. Um, so in recent years, uh, obviously we've seen uh, in over probably the past 10, 15 years, there's just been this completely unsettled state uh, where we're shifting from physical sales uh, to streaming sales. I believe we've already shifted. Um, and uh, album sales are predicted to uh, continue to decline. Uh, annually, it's been about 9.8% since about 2014, and it's considered to uh, continue to decline. Uh, until uh, 2024. Um, so we've shifted away with this. Uh, so this has uh, had record labels uh, concerned. Uh, they've had to focus uh, on other areas. So they've increased emphasis on merchandising, touring, and then of course streaming, as I mentioned. Uh, so streaming platforms such as Apple Music and Spotify have become prevalent. Uh, we live in a, a Spotify era. Um, it's interesting too, even when dealing with my students, I, I uh, tout uh, Tidal as, as something that is the, uh, they have a hi-fi function that is uh, supposedly streaming at CD quality audio. Uh, but even that, sometimes that's a bridge too far to get them to even get the student account on that, uh, just because they can uh, use Spotify for free. Uh, one of the things we talk about in uh, one of my recording classes is the actual pre-version of Spotify what the actual bit rate is of uh, the free versions uh, streaming, and uh, it's frightening. It's frighteningly low. Uh, maybe the MP3 actually is, you're sort of like, that, that was better. Uh, but uh, that's a story for another time. Uh, so uh, the only problem with a lot of these streaming services is that uh, for record labels and how it's affected them, uh, they've actually uh, generated less revenue uh, than they would from physical album sales and digital downloads. So that's sort of this, um, sort of pressure or uh, discord that we, we felt uh, in the industries, uh, or in music industries. Um, so, uh, and for the streaming system to work, uh, the labels have to rely on large volumes of consumers, so greater numbers than before with digital downloads or even uh, physical sales. Uh, so obviously we've seen uh, advances in portable internet devices. This has enabled people to access music pretty much from wherever there is. Uh, either a uh, phone connection or uh, wireless service. Um, and the projections uh, by Ibis World uh, suggest that the industry uh, will eventually, uh, or the revenue made from streaming, will eventually mitigate the losses uh, of physical sales and uh, album sales. And in general, the outlook is pretty good for uh, record labels uh, with a 2.9% increase uh, to 9.5 billion over the next five years. Uh, so there's also this sort of idea that uh, independent labels uh, in sort of the uh, upset and the turmoil that has occurred uh, within the industry, that independent labels have sort of come to arise or especially in the United States have uh, sort of empowered a lot of people and um, are uh, increasingly success successful within uh, the market. Um, but still, we see that the big three record labels, Warner, uh, Universal, and Sony, uh, dominate uh, still the market. Um, the advantages that these independent labels have, uh, obviously, is that they're much smaller and they can move much faster. However, there's still, as this slide uh, gets into in some, some depth here, they're still uh, reliant on the big three and the larger uh, record labels uh, for distribution. And if you were wondering how much independent labels actually make up of the uh, total revenue earned uh, within the larger recording industry, uh, the major labels are still uh, getting about $8.2 billion of revenue annually, where the independent labels uh, are only making about uh, $460 uh, million. Uh, also, if you look at the number of businesses here, there's about 316 major labels where independent labels, uh, there's about 1,700. Uh, there's a lot of fantastic uh, uh, statistics on here. I will be posting uh, not only this presentation, but this PowerPoint uh, on my website um, for you to take a look at. Uh, this information is also uh, occurs on the uh, Ibis World website that if you're connected through your university, you should have access to. Um, it's a great way to just 
to, you know, waste six hours, um, if you need to waste six hours. Uh, so uh, one other industry, so I'm talking about the industry that actually feeds both those uh, major and independent labels are audio production studios. Um, so currently when you look at their annual revenue, uh, these audio production studios or facilities are making about 1.3 billion and uh, once again there's about 1,700 businesses uh, on record. Um, it's also important to note that a uh, majority of the work is being done in post-production. Uh, and only about 25% or the next sort of half is either in post-production or in music recording. Um, so the next couple slides talk about <coughs> sort of this idea that recording studios have become, or excuse me, uh, audio production facilities have become less relevant. Um, and it's sort of a, a myth or sort of a conversation that these larger studios are closing down, things are, are changing hands, and that in fact maybe the, uh, these audio production studios uh, are not doing so well. Um, but contrary to uh, that report, um, let's see, oh, just keep going. Let's see, where is that? Um, from 2019, or to, uh, 2013 to 2018, audio production studios uh, have performed well. Um, and part of the reasoning uh, that these economists suggest that is that the expertise or the technical ex uh, expertise that they provide. Um, and uh, even though uh, there's more access, and uh, uh, Dr. David Tuff talks a lot about the democratization of audio, um, uh, even still, uh, uh, the, these economists cite the research that that expertise is still uh, something that defines uh, these audio production facilities. Um, also talks a little bit about how these post-production skills, so when we say post-production, I'm not just talking about sound design or film, I'm talking about all the aspects that happen after the initial recording process, so this includes mixing and mastering, uh, and how those uh, post-production skills require years of experience uh, to gain expertise, obviously, in uh, mastering and editing recorded content. Uh, and surprisingly, studios uh, within the industry or these audio production studios have experienced virtually none of the revenue and profit erosion that have played, uh, that have played virtually all music licensing and distribution industries. So uh, who works at an audio production facility? Well, a uh, sound recording technician. Um, so uh, I'm using the term sound recording technician uh, because that's what the uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, refers to uh, this uh, job as someone who operates machine and equipment to record, synchronize, and mix or reproduce voices, sound, effects in sporting arenas, theaters, recording studios, or movie and video productions. Uh, so if you look at the uh, median wage, <coughs> Uh, and you look at the annual median wage, it's about 55. These statistics are from 2016 from the U.S. Uh, uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics. Uh, the 2018 wages are actually lower than this. They're actually in the high 40s. Um, this uh, chart here just talks about uh, annual wages based on location and based on the uh, sub-industries within audio production studios. Uh, I always just show this uh, that when I have conversations with students, uh, speaking about the actual jobs in broadcast and sound engineering technicians being around 134,000. Uh, uh, I always compare that to the amount of graphic designers, which is about twice as much, uh, and musicians and singers uh, are at a higher uh, level than uh, broadcast and sound recording engineering technicians. So uh, in order to get a little bit more information about sound recording technicians, uh, I uh, put together a mixed methods online survey. Uh, I ended up getting about 132 respondents uh, from across the United States. Uh, most of them identified as mix engineers, recording engineers, and producers. Uh, well, to a lesser extent, uh, some of them uh, identified as mastering engineers and live sound engineers. I asked them quite a few questions, and there's quite a bit of survey attrition, but uh, the biggest uh, important point that I wanted to ask them was how they classify the work that they do, either as a professional, independent, or hobbyist. Uh, so for professional, I'm classifying that as somebody who's working in industry on commercially released projects, 
versus someone working on projects with independent artists or somebody just working with personal projects with friends as a hobbyist. I did want to make that dis uh, distinction when then I asked them uh, what technology they were using, so specifically what DAW they were using, what plugins and why, uh, and either what streaming uh, or distribution services and why. Um, so uh, as far as the distribution of classification of work, uh, it was a pretty good split of about half professional, uh, half independent uh, uh, sound recording technicians. So uh, I just thought this is always a nice slide to put up there when I asked uh, why, uh, sound recording technicians why they do the work that they did in an open uh, qualitative question. The largest uh, coded response was music and the next was love. Uh, so we just didn't see like dollar signs up here, so that was promising, <laughs> right? That, that, that maybe they're not completely jaded yet. Um, so uh, when we looked at the uh, DAW that they worked in, uh, about 48.6% uh, said they work in Pro Tools. Uh, the other uh, answers were Logic, uh, Ableton, uh, Reaper, Reason, and Cubase. Uh, I think what's kind of interesting is that I really missed the mark on what DAWs they're using because about 25.7% uh, we're working in some other DAW that I did not actually uh, indicate. So uh, comparing uh, level with DAW, so for me, like I said, I wanted to find out if they were professionals versus uh, independents because I wanted to see what bearing that had on what software they used. Um, so uh, Pro Tools was the most used DAW for sound recording technicians. Uh, but were more, was more used by professionals. And then if you look at the independence uh, uh, sound recording engineers and what uh, applications they're using, there's actually a higher variance in the, in the uh, applications that they're using. Uh, whereas if you look, almost all of the professional uh, engineers are using uh, Pro Tools. Uh, I believe Nuendo is not on here. There's a few other DAWs that aren't, so that could also uh, indicate what this other category was. So uh, one other thing that I've, I did ask them what genre they were working in, and I found no correlation between what genre they indicated they worked most in and what DAW they were using. I think often we talk a lot about one DAW is suited for a better type of music and that type of thing. Um, so according to these 132 respondents, that wasn't the case. 40%, uh, uh, once again, of independent responders use DAWs, plugins, and technologies not listed on the survey. So um, that does indicate that perhaps there's a lot of other technology out there uh, that even I, as I was creating this survey, um, was either not aware of or didn't include. Um, great, how are we doing on time? Okay. Um, so uh, just the key findings of my industry review and the SRT survey uh, was that Independent labels only represent about 6% of annual revenue made in recorded music, so that's about uh, 460 million, where ma major labels make about 8.2 billion, and there's only three, uh, 316 businesses. Uh, it should also be noticed that about 65% of business is dominated by the big three, so by Sony, Warner, and Universal. Um, it's important to understand that as expandable income has increased, over the last 10 years, demand for audio and media increases, so that's some good news. Uh, also, the survey suggests non-traditional apps and plugins are being used by independent sound recording technicians, uh, while according to this limited survey, uh, professional uh, sound recording technicians are using industry standard software. So uh, as we're getting towards the end here, I did want to make some predictions uh, about disruptive technologies. If you remember, I was talking about that way back at the start. Uh, so, uh, product development in any, as in any industry, uh, should uh, be about understanding uh, the market uh, and making products that fit a need. Uh, research suggests that the big three need to adopt any new product uh, for success. Uh, so, in other words, uh, if you're creating a disruptive technology, uh, it's important uh, to uh, get buy-in from these larger um, labels. Uh, the disadvantage of selling to them, obviously, is you have to use an enterprise model, which is much larger. Uh, and you have to have, uh, a, it's a large cost to get involved. Um, for audio production facilities, um, 
Uh, any sort of advances in applications or disruptive technology should be focused on post-production, uh, sound design, and music recording. Uh, so specifically focused on post-production, sound design, and music recording, which is about 60% of that 1.3 billion. Um, yep, and uh, you should also focus on tools, apps or plugins that create mastered audio, because mastered audio is the coin of the realm. Uh, if you are looking to uh, focus on independent sound recording technicians, which once again only make up about 6% of the uh, market, uh, linking independent engineers to larger commercial markets would be important, uh, helping independent engineers gain experience, and also help artists create final masters. I put education in there, as always, that is the key. Um, so one of my takeaways, uh, and this is my final thought, is that the uh, MP3 changed how people consume music, uh, not the invention itself, but its application. We moved away from sort of the physical paradigm to a streaming one. Um, and uh, this was such a disruptive technology because it uh, disrupted how the major labels collected revenue. However, it did not affect their control of the market. Uh, so, uh, once again, when you're looking at the MP3 and file sharing services, uh, it's, a, it's important to understand that success was actually not based on pairing with uh, the major labels, but actually circumventing their distribution and control uh, to establish a new paradigm.